Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online.
Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for a very special post-election Smart Women, Smart Power event. I'm Beverly Kirk, Director of the Smart Women, Smart Power Initiative here at CSIS and a fellow in the International Security Program. We are very pleased to welcome Fox News host and former White House Press Secretary Dana Perino for a very timely discussion of the outcome and the aftermath of the 2020 election and the potential impact on U.S. national security, foreign and domestic policy. The Smart Women, Smart Power Speaker Series is possible thanks to our founding partner, City. We are very grateful for City's continued support, and it's a pleasure to welcome Candy Wolf, Head of Global Government Affairs at City. Candy? Thank you, Bev, and thanks everyone for joining us online this afternoon as we continue our Smart Women, Smart Power Series for 2020 in our virtual format. 
At City, we're celebrating our fifth year supporting this series to bring together women leaders in foreign policy, national security, and the business community to convene a dialogue on the most pressing issues facing our world. It's this time of year, every four years, that we're used to gathering together in different circles in Washington to dissect what the rest of the country has told us via their ballots about how we're doing. While we can't gather in person this year, I'm hopeful this presents an opportunity to expand those discussions beyond the normal Beltway crowd. And I know for certain these virtual sessions have been instrumental in reaching City's global workforce. So I welcome our colleagues from around the world and everyone else for joining us today. I'm personally excited to hear from Dana Perino. Dana's a former colleague and we shared many a moment early in the morning around the table in the Roosevelt Room, talking her about media and I about Congress and the impact on foreign policy. I would say we were the female tag team. We we're the only people that seemed to talk at 7.30 in the morning. Uh, Dana was a guiding force and counselor inside the White House and we're so fortunate to have her today to bring her experience and her analysis to the questions of how we interpret this election and how we move forward on the many challenges that still confront our country and our globe. So thank you for joining us today and back to you, Beth. Candy, thank you so much. And before we get started, I just wanna remind the audience that you do have the opportunity to submit a question to ask uh, Dana about as we do our conversation. There is a link that says, ask a question here on the CSIS webpage, uh, our event page for this event. Well, our guest today doesn't really need much of an in introduction. Dana Perino is the anchor of the Daily Briefing, co-host of The Five, and co-host of the podcast, I'll Tell You What, all on Fox News Channel. Previously, as I mentioned, she served as White House Press Secretary for President George W. Bush and was the first woman to do so in a Republican administration. She is the author of two best-selling books, and she is the founder of the mentoring or the Minute Mentoring Program, a women's leadership program that is designed to foster the next generation of women leaders. Dana, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for the honor. Actually, I have to say, Beverly, when you asked me to do this, it was, I do feel very honored to be asked. Um, you know, I've, I've been away from Washington now for, well, since 2009, 2011, really. And um, I always thought that you really couldn't participate in public affairs you know, from New York. Um, of course, that turns out not to be true. Um, so I'm honored to be here and to be here with Candy. Um, and, and before we get started, I would just want to say something. Um, one of the reasons Candy and I spoke the most in that meeting is because Josh Bolton, the chief of staff, thought that she and I had the two most important roles in the morning meeting. Um, and we were um, seated at the top end of a big oval table there in the Roosevelt Room, and she would go first and then I would go. But you know, a lot of what we were able to do was to shape the day because um, you, know, you have to brief yourself up real quickly in the morning to know what's going on. And then I think she would probably agree, we ended up you know, getting 90% of what we needed for our morning from that one meeting. So um, it was always a pleasure to sit across the table from her and also you know, to listen to, sometimes our colleagues would have these grandiose ideas of what was possible either on the Hill or in the media and we would let them have their say and then crush their dreams right away. <laughs> and that probably felt good on some days, I'm guessing. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about the election outcome. Um, was it what you expected? Was there anything that surprised you? I have to say, having gone through 2016, um, I, when people would ask me, who, who do you think, that, I would say that um, for 12 hours of the day, I believe that Joe Biden was going to win. And for another 12 hours of the day, I thought that Donald Trump was going to win. Um, and in that last two weeks, as I was talking to both sides, but I would say even more Democrats that were starting to feel queasy, like they were like, I don't know, I don't know. I think that, he, that Trump might be able to win again. And then the Trump campaign always expressed a lot of confidence, even if their internal polls didn't show that, like it didn't matter. They just were always expressing total confidence. And confidence is kind of contagious. And we talk about that in mentoring as well, right? For women, like you, the more confident you are, the more you seem to be able to, to rise. Um, and I sort of discounted that a little bit. And 2020 has been such a, a strange year that the night before the election, I told my husband, I don't think I'll be surprised at any outcome. 
And watching the returns that night, I actually think that, say for a few states either way, sort of like in 2016, this was a pretty close election. I would say I was not as surprised on the presidential level. I do think that we need, once we are able to digest all of things that happened, I think what happened down ballot in senators races and house races and also in state legislatures across America, I'm a little surprised that the Democrats did not do better. Of course, now looking at it, hindsight is also 2020. You think, well, obviously um, the Democrats message wasn't going to work, but in 2016, there were very few ticket splitters, meaning people who would vote for, um, let's say Hillary Clinton for president and then a Republican for a Senate or a House seat um, or vice versa, Trump and, and a Democrat. This year, there seems to have been quite a few ticket splitters. And I don't know if we have fully appreciated that yet, but I do think it tells you something. We knew that enthusiasm to vote in this election was very high. Voter engagement and knowledge was very high and voters are smart and they like divided government. In our country, we tend to like divided government and it looks like depending on what happens in these two Senate runoff races in Georgia that we will have divided government. It definitely, the, what you mentioned about the down ballot races, that they haven't gotten a lot of attention or at least the, the attention that they probably deserve because so much attention has been focused on the outcome of the presidential race. But I think when people take the time to sift through the numbers, like you say, um, there will be, uh, I think, some surprises and uh, it will be very interesting to see what happens. And can I add one other thing to that? Um, the other thing that it's taking some time to figure out, again, all of these things, but the coalitions are different and changing, meaning the makeup of who voted for Republicans and the makeup who voted for Democrats, it evolved a little bit. And it will be interesting to see can the parties capitalize on that? Just from the Republican side, for example, I do think that the number of Hispanics that voted for President Trump and where they voted for him, for example, along the Rio Grande in those Southern Texas um, counties, there's a county in Texas that has not voted, it's right there on the border, has not voted for, for a Republican since 1906. Did not vote for a Republican in 2016, but they, it voted for Trump in 2020. And one of the things that they talked about was law and order and economic opportunity. For Democrats, they found that some suburban white men decided to go their way. Now, would they have done that with a different candidate at the top of the ticket? Like if Bernie Sanders had become the nominee? I don't think so. So both sides now have this opportunity to think about, do we have a different coalition and a makeup of voters that we can continue to capitalize upon and to answer for, to, you know, not just to them or for them. Rahm Emanuel, who was Barack Obama's chief of staff, had a warning for the Democrats. He said, you cannot just rent the suburbs. You have to buy in the suburbs. So everybody is kind of up for grabs still. Sorry, I just wanted to add that. Oh, that's a great point to add. And I want to follow up on it, uh, particularly on the Latino vote. Do you think that another message in what happened with the split in the Latino vote means that politicians of all stripes are going to have to further um, educate themselves on the differences between the different communities that make up what we call the, the Latino or the Latinx population, because um, Cubans in Florida voted very differently from you know, Latinos in Arizona. So it, it, there, it, is there too much of this just put Well, people I think you know, what's kind of wonderful about an America, American melting pot is that Hispanics are also just Americans, right? Like, we're all just Americans. So, you know, if you work in Texas, you care about oil jobs a lot, but those are the high pay paying jobs. Um, now, if you live in Cuba, you, you might, or Cuba, excuse me, if you live in Miami and you're, whole community has very strong feelings about um, Fidel Castro, et cetera, then that might be a different thing. But I just think overall, it's that people are looking for opportunity. Not, there's this big, in, there's a very interesting debate that's going to continue about how we approach two words, equity and equality. And 
opportunity, I think, is the place where both parties need to be thinking about opportunity for what? Opportunity for education, jobs, healthcare, um, your opportunity for liberty, your opportunity for your American dream. I think that that part is very interesting, but kind of, I'm kind of excited that maybe we're just all Americans and that identity politics is really not working. That's, a, that's an important point to, to expound upon. Is it identity politics aren't working or is it just now that everybody's an identity group? Yeah, I think, I actually think one of the interesting things I remember in 2016, um, I always point this out to people, one of the biggest applause lines of President Trump's speeches and rallies was that America is becoming too politically incorrect or too politically correct, excuse me. And I think some people think, well, actually maybe, could it be that America is becoming more polite or more sensitive or more understanding of other people and their, their wants and desires and worries and, and fears and being more sensitive to that? Or has it just gotten out of control? I did hear from a, a really interesting uh, woman who you guys actually should have on. Her name is Liesl Hickey. Um, she works um, on sort of congressional races. She did a very interesting months long suburban study um, where they went back to the same voters every week and engaged them on all the different issues that were going on in the news and policies, et cetera. And to a, to a person, it wasn't just suburban women, I think it was both men and women. The whole idea of cancel culture was a big problem for Democrats with those suburban people. Um, they did not want uh, monuments to be torn down they didn't want to erase history. They wanted to do reforms, not defund the police, things like that. The whole cancel culture thing like on campus, not being allowed to speak, possibly losing your job just because you express an opinion. That was a big deal for th some of those voters. And I think those conversations will continue to bubble up. Um, as we move forward. Um, and speaking of moving forward, um, there's a transition or it, it, it if you the outcome of the election, there is a transition that is, is happening, but the president uh, has not conceded the election and is pursuing legal challenges in states where the votes were, were close, specifically Pennsylvania, Georgia, Nevada, Michigan, and Arizona. So how do you think this is going to impact the transition? Because the legal challenges aren't actually expected to change the overall outcome of the yeah. Well, so I actually just came from doing my show and President-elect Biden was giving a speech and then took questions. I don't know if you had a chance to see it. Um, and he was asked this very question. You know, if you look on Twitter, people are very upset that the transition might be halted or delayed. And Joe Biden was asked three times in this press, short press conference about it. And he was very calm and he said, everything will work out. We have what we need. Access to classified documents is important, but look, there's only one president at a time. There's nothing I can do about it. He was very, very calm and assured. And one of the questions also was, what do you think about these Republican senators who haven't called to congratulate you yet or, or recognize that and accepted that you've won? And Joe Biden had a two word answer. He said, they will. Thank you very much. And then he left, you know, he, it was kind of very interesting. Like, I think everybody else is a lot more spun up than the president elect. Um, so I think that some patience is in order. Um, look at the shoe were on the other foot and it had gone the other way and the Democrats were pursuing legal challenges. Um, they have every right to do that. And so did the Trump team. Um, thing is that you do have to present evidence to a judge and then you have to see how that goes. I just think that it is kind of important that as long as there are questions of irregularities, problems that we ought to investigate those and chase them down and get them done, investigated because if they're just blown off, you could have many, many millions of people never believing the results of the election. So I think that the president elect was leading and suggesting everybody just be calm. I think there will be or there will come a time when when people will actually I know Joe you said that Joe Biden said yeah people will call and congratulate and and accept uh, the mm -hmm. the the results is there is there a point 
at which that happens. I, I mean, we have a few weeks between now and when the election. Well, you know, especially for your audience and, and, and your organization, um, the foreign leader calls are coming in. Right. Right. So because the, they're not worried about their domestic politics. Mm -hmm. um, so, so those are happening at pace. And yes, I think so. I mean, of course, look, anything could happen. I'm not saying that there isn't, but my, my gut instinct is that yes, eventually it'll work out. Mm -hmm. and, and do you think, are there any uh, post-election implications for foreign and domestic policy that we should be paying attention to? During well, this sure. I mean, you know, I don't know what it means. Maybe it means nothing, but the president of the United States is president until January 20th at noon. Um, and he fired his defense secretary yesterday. Right. Um, and I just remember from that transition between 08 and 09, I would, we were told that that is the time that, you know, any country is in some sort of not peril, but it's just a transition is a shaky time. Like you don't have people in place, processes in place necessarily as you go from one administration to the next. So sure, I mean, that could be a concern. There is um, a suggestion that the CIA director, Gina Haspel, could also be um, removed or fired. And that the FBI director is possible, uh, possibly on the chopping block too. I don't think if that happens, I don't think anyone will be surprised that that happens. Now, when it comes to our adversaries, will they try to take advantage? Possibly, right? And if you've seen in Europe over the past three weeks, there have been increased Islamic terrorism attacks. I'm a little concerned about that here. Um, you also have the situation where, um, you know, in the, the Middle East is always what it is, but you have to think that some of these world leaders that have had very decent relationships with the Trump administration are thinking they might not have that with the Biden administration. And I'd put Saudi Arabia at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. One uh, other foreign policy question that I have been thinking about is just the the potential for swings back and, and forth. Uh, the President Trump and his administration had a particular worldview and they enacted yeah. policies that reflected that worldview, which every president, you know, has the right to do and certainly want to make their impact and, and change things. And I'm just curious uh, about what the expectation will be um, if you have another when you or I shouldn't say if but when you have another administration come in yeah. and switch everything back that's more in line with what former President Obama had um, for example rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement something that President-elect Biden has said he wants to do or um, re with uh, reverse the the call to withdraw from the World Health Organization um, that kind of whiplash um, does yeah. that Open a, open a door for concerns from allies and maybe uh, even open a door for adversaries to try to take advantage? So it, it's interesting. I, I think that the Biden team might pick up where the Trump team leaves off. I mean, let's talk about a couple things, right? So NATO, an mm -hmm. important alliance. President Trump is butted heads with NATO, but he's, he's, he's never sought to destroy it. One of the things he did is demand that, that those NATO countries pay their fair share. But it wasn't fair that America was carrying this load. And you know what? I think you could probably get 90% agreement in America on that. And I don't think that any, that any new administration like the Biden administration was gonna come in and be like, you know what guys, you don't have to pay those, the, the, those commitments. We're not gonna worry about those. I think that now that the pres President Trump has changed that, I don't think that, that, will, uh, that there will be backsliding on that. Um, I don't think that anybody will, in the Biden administration, I can't imagine that they would suggest that we shouldn't have moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem in Israel. Um, I think that they would welcome those agreements, the, the Abraham Accord agreements. I also don't think there would be that much change with China, right? Um, if you think about where, especially the, the progressive left is on China and the right is on China, and now we have coronavirus and where America is on China, I don't think there'll be that many changes there. Don't, I don't think so. Now, perhaps on trade policy and tariffs, I think maybe you could see some there. There's gonna be some interesting issues coming up in regards to tech, like the big tech sector. If you think about these, com these companies 
that employ so many people, they, they make so much money. I'm thinking Google, Facebook, um, not so much Twitter, but these big companies and Europe is coming after them. And some people in America are coming after them, but these are American companies. Right? So even for example, President Trump might be really mad at Facebook um, because of perceived bias against conservatives, but by God, he is not gonna let the Europeans put more taxes on them stood up for them. I think that's the kind of thing is going to continue. So I actually believe that on a foreign policy standpoint, I don't know what, how much would be different except for one thing. And that is the Paris Climate Accords. I, even for me, I'm like, fine, rejoin. It's, I, to me, it's very symbolic. Um, as President Trump has pointed out, our emissions are already down below those commitments anyway. So to me, that seems very symbolic, but sometimes symbolism means something. So, okay, fine, whatever. But the Iran nuclear deal, that's the one that I don't see how a Biden administration re-enters that agreement without some pretty furious kicking and screaming. There weren't many Democrats that actually supported that deal um, when President Obama was in office. So I mean, you all know a lot more than I do. I've, I've been a little bit out of that game for a while, but that's the one that I think, I, I don't see how, I know that there's a different approach, but I don't know how they're gonna deal with it. Uh -huh. And shifting to domestic, domestic policy, essentially the same question. Um, uh, President-elect Biden has said he wants to reinstate DACA, that he wants to uh, lift the ban on immigration from majority Muslim countries. Uh, again, that's a, another, another swing uh, away from what the Trump administration uh, has done. How do you see uh, those issues and other domestic issues playing out? So I think one of the things that you know, President Trump has been frustrated by is divided government. And it is likely that Joe Biden will also have divided government. So what did President Trump do and President Obama and President Bush, President Clinton, you tried to enact policy through executive order. But we've seen that if you make an executive order in one administration, it's easily undone on day one of a new administration. Mm -hmm. So I imagine that, for example, DACA, that that executive order will be immediately removed. Um, I think on the ban on Muslim country, you know, I, I think that once the Trump administration had to back way off of what they originally um, proposed, that one I could see maybe happening a little bit uh, more slowly, perhaps. Um, maybe I, I could be wrong there. You know, Biden gave a speech today about health care and all the things he wants to do in the Congress, but I'm looking at the makeup of this Congress with the Democrats having lost seats in the House, and you still have some pretty conservative members, um, conservative, moderate Democrats in the Senate, like a Senator Joe Manchin. They're not going to vote to um, end the filibuster. And so I just think it's either gonna be gridlock or the big ideas are going to either have to be try to be done by executive order or they won't happen at all. Mm -hmm. It, do you foresee the uh, uh, the issue over executive order resurfacing? Because for a long time, uh, there were many, many criticisms of presidents using or overly using executive orders. President Trump has made, um, some would say, really good use or depending on your view, bad use of the executive order, but he's used it a lot. Um, do you foresee that argument re, uh, continuing to be ever present um, in, an, in a Biden administration if he does choose to, to do a lot of things by executive order? Sure, and I think that you'll also see, um, all of a sudden you'll see uh, Republicans becoming fiscal conservatives again, when, when they weren't for a while. <laughs> but I also think that, you know, I, have, I haven't really talked about the coronavirus. I mean, th that it, the, the COVID-19 issue is overshadowing all of this, right? So actually Mitch McConnell and Biden and many members of the House and Senate, Pelosi, like they know they need to get more relief out to the American people. So I think that will be priority number one. And when it comes to cost, yes, they will quibble over that, but I think that that could get done. If it doesn't get done in the lame duck, I think that will be very unfortunate because there are many, 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 many small business owners and parents. I'm, I'm very worried about the economy. Actually, my anxiety is about these people who through no fault of their own cannot work. It's not their fault and they need more help. And it is, it is disgraceful that we haven't been able to do that before this election. 
So I think that will happen pretty quickly. You took my last policy question before we shift gears to talk about your career path. Um, I was going to ask your thoughts on COVID-19 and the fact that it was it was kind of the issue that really overshadowed everything in the 2020 election and oh, uh, and the lack of uh, of a renewal of the yeah. of the, of the funding uh, in July. So, and you oh, know, it's so interesting. In February, um, I remember on February 6th, 2020. I was in Washington, DC, and I was covering the State of the Union address. The president had just beaten back a, a, an attempt to impeach him. The Senate trial had just been, uh, had just finished. The president was not impeached in the Senate, or not convicted in the, I'm forgetting the word that they use. There's always specific words. It was impeached in the House, not convicted in the Senate. Um, the economy was guns a blazing. He was looking like, it was going to be a walk to re-election. I mean, you looked at the Democratic primary and thought, which one of these people can beat him? And that was February 6th. Um, by the end of that month, it was pretty clear that COVID was going to be a bigger issue than, look, frankly, that than people on all sides were saying. The scientists were trying to keep up with it. It was a very tricky thing to figure out at first, also because China was not uh, cooperating and transparent. And by March 20th, everybody's locked down at home and it changed everything. Mm -hmm. And over 230,000 Americans have lost their lives. Think how many people, 230,000, let's say, let's say they have 10 family members each and 10 family, friends and family that are heartbroken. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's been very devastating. I know I have friends here in the city who, it's not easy to run a restaurant in New York City and they've lost their life savings trying to take care of their employees, trying to get the PPP loan. Now there's 25% capacity. You know, the frustration of all of, all of that is, it's really big. And what's interesting is that the issue of lockdown versus not lockdown really did become pretty big in the election. Right. Um, with many people, even in places where there were high numbers of cases voting for Trump, I think recognizing that we have to figure out a way to live with this, whatever that is gonna look like, right? Um, I think there is hope about the vaccine. I don't think President Trump's team has done everything perfectly but by all means, but I do think that they did a lot of things right. And I think that this Operation Warp Speed, um, not only just to, to help encourage the vaccines, but to figure out the logistics of getting the vaccine out to the people who need it most, that actually has done pretty well. And the Biden-Harris administration will inherit a lot of that work. Um, but in the meantime, there's people that haven't paid rent. And you know what, I have a prediction. Think of how many people haven't paid rent, which means that the landlords haven't been paid, which means they can't pay their mortgages, which means that the lenders are the ones that are left holding the bag. And I imagine that in six months from now, there will be legislation in which we have to bail out the big banks. And imagine how that's gonna go over. We're gonna we're gonna uh, take down notes on this prediction and we'll come back to you in six months. Okay. <laughs> I, hope I'm wrong. But, I mean, I just I don't I don't see any other way for these loans to be forgiven. I mean, you're not if you don't pay your rent for five months, that doesn't mean that it, the rent's forgiven. That means that you still owe that past five months rent plus the additional months. There's a guy here. Uh, owns a pizza parlor, was bring, uh, right under the Brooklyn Bridge, was bringing in $130,000 a month. Lockdown happened, no money, no money, no money. Available, you can now you can open up for takeout and 25% capacity. He's bringing in now $30,000 a month. His rent is $12,000 a month. His employee cost is $12,000 a month. So they haven't paid rent, but that rent is still due. Right. So to me, I just don't see how that gets fixed unless you actually forgive the lender. Right, right. Well, that is a that is an excellent uh, an excellent point and an excellent place for us to pivot to talk about your career path because a lot of people may not know that you actually started out as a journalist uh, way back when. Yeah. Um, but you, I wasn't but very. You, <laughs> <laughs> you left journalism. I'm curious as to why. Um. 
Oh gosh, you know, partly divine intervention, maybe, you know, ever since I was a little kid, um, when I was in third grade, my dad required me to read um, the Rocky Mountain News and the Denver Post before he got home from work. And I had to choose two articles to discuss before dinner. And then we would discuss them. Why did you pick this article? What did you think about it? And he would play devil's advocate and really help my critical thinking skills, actually. Um, and we were a big news family. We read all the mag. My dad subscribed to all the magazines. Um, and we watched all the local news. And then the evening news, because we lived in Denver, which is mountain time, um, mm -hmm. to get ABC, CBS, and NBC at all. Like, you could watch 90 minutes worth of news. We often did. Um, on, on Sunday nights, I, I didn't like to go outside to play because I was afraid I would miss 60 minutes. So my dad and mom would set the timer on the stove um, so that it would alert me when it was 10 minutes till 60 minutes was gonna start. So like, I always, always wanted to do it. I was on a speech and debate team. I went to college on a speech team scholarship, thank goodness, and that really helped my family. And, um, Thought that's what I wanted to do was local news up to network news and look I don't really think this is a factor but I do wonder about this so when I was a girl the the three networks and the PBS and there wasn't really cable news uh, so it was Dan Rather, Peter Jennings, Tom Brokaw and Jim McNeil or Jim Lair and I can't remember McNeil's first name and I'm blanking on it. I, I, I yeah. would help the you out. Robert, so, Robert Altman, right at the top. And I guess, you know, the, you know, there, there's that phrase that you have to see her to be her. Uh -huh. Meaning you, you know, that's why it's so important for us to do events like this um, or to see that, oh, you can be an astronaut. You can be a pilot. You can do that. And there's a lot of firsts that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to, I started in local news and then I was doing it and I was looking to get jobs. It was the way you got a job back then. And you called this 1-800 number, 1-800 media line. Media line. <laughs> and uh, there was no internet. And I started realizing, I'm like, wait, this is paying how much? And they would want a two year commitment. And I was looking at it going, how do you possibly work your way up at that level, at that scale? Anyway, um, I eventually, moved back to Denver after graduate school. I was waiting tables and then an opportunity arose for me to move to Washington DC to work as a press secretary, no, excuse me, as a staff assistant. And then I became a press secretary like six weeks later. And I just kind of, part of it I think is divine intervention. Um, I don't think I would be doing what I'm doing today if I hadn't had this roundabout career um, mm -hmm. that took me to Washington where, you know, as women, you can really, really excel and succeed. And I look around and I think, look who's running this place. You think of the, the, the two last, or the, the last, in the last two campaigns, presidential campaigns that were winning, Trump and then Biden, both mm -hmm. were run by women, right? right? Uh, Kellyanne Conway and then Jan O'Malley Dillon. Um, you look around at the chiefs of staff, who's the chief of staff to Mitch McConnell? Oh, Sharon, oh yeah, you look around, women are really able to do a lot in Washington DC, um, much more, I think corporate America is, ca is still you know, catching up, but they're getting there. Um, but it was a great place for me to, to rise pretty quickly. And you mentioned that pivot to working uh, uh, in politics. Uh, I also read that you declared when you were six years old that you would one day work <laughs> in the White House. And I have to ask yeah, you. I was, yeah, I, think I, was, I was in first grade and that was back in the day when, when your dad had a chance to go to a, 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 the annual conference of human resources, he got to take his family but my little sister got, had to stay home and I got to go to Washington DC. And my mom's friend from high school was a, um, like an admin person in the Carter White House. So we got to go for a tour over at the White House. Um, and yeah, so it's stuck in my brain. Of course, I didn't really think I'd ever really work at the White House, but um, I did and it was like the best experience of my life and led, led me to this opportunity where I look at my career now and I think, wow, everything I ever wanted to do, I'm getting a chance to do now. Mm -hmm. And do you have advice for those who are in the transition and who will be working into uh, the, the Biden administration, uh, given your perspective as someone who worked for quite a while for uh, President Bush? 
Yeah, I do. So here's what I would say. Um, there's a lot of jobs outside of the White House. If you didn't work on the campaign uh, or don't have like close ties, it's probably unlikely that you would land a job in the White House in that first year of a new administration. So look around. There are so many jobs that have to be filled. Um, I always say, take the job nobody else wants, right? And then work your way up. Um, you think that people really wanted to work at the Council on Environmental Quality uh, at the White House? But nobody wanted that job in the middle of the terrorism. I, I, I love those issues, energy and environmental issues. So I took those and I took them off Ari Fleischer's plate. He didn't have to worry about them at all. And that allowed me a chance to shine a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I also worked at the Justice Department as a spokesperson, and that really helped because I'm not a lawyer. But working there for about a year, it's like doing your first year in law school, really. I had so much to learn. Um, if you're in communications, I recommend really becoming strong on the policy mm -hmm. because you cannot be a good communications person, press secretary, anything. If you don't understand the policy, that will set you apart. Um, but definitely look around at all the different possibilities um, at the different agencies. And then you can get to the White House. I'm not saying you'll never get to the White House. But if you're frustrated because you're not going to get there, start somewhere else. There's lots of different opportunities. And we have one question from uh, our audience uh, that I want to ask you here. Okay. Uh, and if you do have questions, please submit those through the Ask a Question button on the CSIS event page website. Um, uh, this question uh, says, what do the results of the election mean for the U.S. efforts toward international development? Will the U.S. claim a position as a beacon of international support or regress to nationalism and relative isolationism? Yeah, so um, I'm a huge, big, bleeding heart. Um, I love what we do uh, as Americans to help um, spread freedom around the world and also to bring hope and healing to people that need it. I feel like we have a moral obligation to do so. Um, that's not necessarily widely shared viewpoint. Um, I think that most people think that we spend 90% of our budget on foreign aid when it's actually like less than 1%. So some PR needs to be done around that. And, and I also think that what Condi Rice would always explain, former Secretary Rice, of course, she would always say that um, it is in our national interest to help. Right, reframing that discussion. It's in our national interest to be a part of this discussion. To be, and I, 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 th I do think that um, some of these world leaders, as Joe Biden said today, but that they've called him and hoping, what did he, how he put it, that hoping that American institutions will reassert itself. Like, I know that some people think that they don't want America to be the policeman of the world. I'm like, I do. <laughs> I'm like, I'm very comfortable with America being the policeman for the world. Um, Although, I, look, I love the cooperation um, that we have with, with our allies. And I think that the more that we can expand upon uh, freedom and democracy and supporting people um, around the world who are anxious about their futures, I think that's really where we can do a great job. And um, I remember when First Lady Melania Trump went to Africa and I loved that trip. And I, I know she was touched I know her heart was touched by that. And I know that Nikki Haley, um, when she was the UN ambassador and she went to Africa, and I have a very strong um, affinity for Africa. And I do think that our national nonprofit, our nonprofits do a lot, but our government also plays an important role. And I think that the State Department, you know, that they've been quiet about it. They don't do a lot of press releases around it. They've done more than you think. Um, and I, I just hope that that, that continues. I, I believe that it will. And if I could follow up, uh, you spent uh, uh, quite a bit of time in South Africa, if I remember correctly, yeah. um, in between working in government uh, uh, positions. Uh, you spent about a year working with- No, no not a year. My I wanted to do six months. My husband talked me into six weeks. Um, it was in between, it was right, we left the day of inauguration for um, when President Bush left DC. And we, um, we did some volunteer work in, um, at a PEPFAR site Mm -hmm. in South Africa in a place called Fish Hook. And I just felt like that was important for me because it gave me what I call perspective with a capital P. Mm -hmm. Like working in a White House can give you a big head. And I think it's really important to just be reminded of all that we have here, not take it for granted and to remember that there 
is um, the forgotten poor around the world. And uh, I, didn't want, I didn't want to lose sight of that. I wanted to reconnect with that. And then since then, my husband and I have been very active with Mercy Ships, mm -hmm. which is um, an American-based but international sta internationally staffed um, surgical ship that serves the west coast of Africa. And, and we've had an opportunity to go twice, once to Benin and the other time to Congo, um, where we stayed on the ship. And Fox News has been incredibly helpful in publicizing all of that. Um, but they really do come through to try to help support me and um, in my care about that issue. Uh -huh. And in the final moments that we have here, because I know you have to get ready for your next show. Yeah, Oh, right. <laughs> um, I just want to quickly ask you about Minute Mentoring. I mentioned that right off the top that you're a co-founder and uh, you're working to groom the next generation of women leaders. And we, with this series, uh, we have a lot of Smart Women, Smart Power fans who are young women, young professionals, uh, young students in, in college. Um, and I'm just uh, wondering what led you to start the group and what are you hoping this next generation of women leaders are able to do to make the world better? Oh gosh, I could talk for hours about this because I really, this is one of my favorite things that I do. Um, I guess the way that it got started is because I was the first Republican woman to serve in a, as press secretary um, and I'd had other great jobs and I have great jobs now at, at Fox News as, as anchor of these two, well, anchor of one program and co-host of another. Um, I feel a, an enormous responsibility to pass it on. Mm -hmm. I find that this younger generation is ravenous for mentoring advice. Um, I also find that many of them, they want you to tell them what the plan should be and then they'll follow the plan. Like if you give them a plan, say like, here is how you will become White House press secretary. They're like, they're on it. They will do that plan. But what I have is what I, that plan, that plan doesn't exist. You can't pre-write that plan. And in the book that I wrote um, called And the Good News Is, one of the things that I write about is that I, I was a natural born worrier and I, I have to really work at not succumbing to that worry. Mm -hmm. And I would always try to plan my life out. And when I look back at all the opportunities that I've had, none of them are things that I planned. Mm -hmm. They were just opportunities that I was able to take advantage of when they came my way. And also I would say that if I look back, I think about the people who gave me a real boost. Um, you know, the President Bush, of course, um, the two members of Congress that I work for, Dan Schaefer, Scott McInnes, um, here at, at Fox News, giving opportunities to like spread my wings, like instead of just doing the five, do you wanna anchor your own news show? How about joining the election coverage team? Um, I just took advantage of everything that I possibly could and find where your strengths are. I think one of mine is that I find that I try to be the most well-read person in any room I go into. Mm -hmm. I used to do that in the briefing room, right? Like I would say that I didn't want anybody in that briefing room to know more than I did. And that was, there's power in that. Um, but it also means you can't shortcut it. I don't watch a lot of Bravo TV. I read a lot. And I've also have been just loving podcasts. I'm learning so much and it's a different way to be able to learn. It's actually more efficient. I can, I have about a mile walk to work and back. I can get through one or two podcasts a day that way. There's just so many opportunities. So what I wish for this next generation is like you, you are, if you are here in America um, or even I would say Great Britain, Amer American educated women, there's pretty much nothing you can't do right now. So embrace that mm -hmm. and be gracious about it, right? And I would say the only thing I ask for anybody that we mentor at Minute Mentor with here is the only thing I ask is that you pass it on to the next generation. Well, that is a perfect place for us to stop our conversation here. I could talk to you forever. Dana Perino, thank you so much for being a part of the Smart Women, Smart Power speaker series thank today. You. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.
And thanks to all of you for joining us here. Our next Smart Women, Smart Power event is coming up on December 2nd at 9 a.m. And we will host Leanne Carrot, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Boeing Defense and Space Security. And our regular moderator, Nina Easton, will be back in the chair for that interview. Thanks so much for being with us today. Bye.